Okay, today is April 5th, 2024, and we have a very special guest on the show today, Vijay Prashad. Vijay is a historian, journalist, author, and activist. Vijay is the author of 40 books, including Washington Bullets, Red Star Over the Third World, The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World and the Poorer Nations, A Possible History of the Global South. His latest book, The Withdrawal, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, and the Fragility of the U.S. Power, uh, was written with Noam Chomsky. BJ is also the executive director of the Tri-Continental Tri Institute for Social Research, and, and he's the chief correspondent for the Globetrotter. BJ is also the chief editor, editor of Leftward Books uh, in New Delhi and a senior non-resident fellow at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies, uh, Renmin University of China. BJ has also appeared in two films, the Shadow World in 2016 and two meetings in 2017. BJ is also one of the hosts of the best weekly news summary entitled Give the People What They Want, which airs on Fridays at 11 a.m. Eastern time on, on the Pe People's Dispatch YouTube channel. I recommend everyone to check it out. Um, BJ, it's an honor to have you back on the show and, and welcome back to the show. Hey, you're so, so kind. And, and I just want to say before we get going that it's really moving that beneath us is this list of names of, of political prisoners and those who, who have now left us. And I recognized my friend Eddie Conway's name there. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just stopped me. You know, Eddie was such a terrific man, um, a guiding light of so many people. And, you know, you have a list of others. Mumia Abu Jamal's birthday is coming up, mm -hmm. a 70 year birthday. It's unbelievable. I've, often thought that Mumia Abu Jamal might be in prison, but he's the freest man in America. And, you know, what an extraordinary soul he is. But I just want to congratulate you. Um, I probably didn't notice this the previous time was I was with you, but I think it's so important that you have these names just repeat and repeat and repeat so that they are not forgotten. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, well, jumping into it, you know, today I wanted to talk to you about the incredibly important and expertly researched and written and also must read study published by the Tri-Continental on January 23rd, entitled, quote, Hyperimperialism, a Dangerous Decade, a uh, New Stage, a Decadent New Stage, excuse me. Um, note that the study can be found on the Tri-Continental's Tri website, and you can even download a PDF version of the study. Uh, we will also link the study in the description of this interview so that our audience can more easily access it. BJ, can you expl please explain why the Tri-Continental commenced this study and, and what the term hyperimperialism means? Um, so really, I'm, I'm really happy that we're spending time talking about this study. Um, it's 186 pages. It's free to download. I very much hope people will read it. It was done in collaboration with Global South Insights, which is building up, I think, one of the most interesting and informative databases, um, you know, just accumulating all the data from the World Bank, from the IMF, from, you know, the United Nations, from different countries and so on, so that we get a clear picture, a fact-based picture of the situation in the world. So I'm very proud of this study, and I say it to people that it really is, the, so far, after eight years of the work of Tricontinental, it's a kind of culmination of our thinking. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's been a kind of um, confusion, a debate maybe, not confusion as much as a debate, about how to understand the world now. Um, you know, on the one side, there's some people who argue that we're in the middle of an inter-imperialist situation, you know, between say the United States, Russia, China, and so on. There are others who say, well, no, this is a new period of multipolarity. And, you know, we have to recognize that for what it is. Um, none of these actually are, to my mind, factually based, based on what we have uh, begun to understand. So we took some common categories uh, first and tried to unravel, what are they? We took the category, Global North. Um, what is the Global North? The Global North set of countries, many of them with a history in colonialism. They were colonial powers. 
um, these countries have, have actually established a institutional grouping. So for instance, they are institutionally grouped around the G7 countries, the group of seven, um, led by the United States, of course, France, Italy, Canada, Germany, Japan, um, and the United Kingdom are a kind of political bureau of the global north. They set the terms for other countries who, who basically follow them. Then there's a military alliance, you know, rooted in NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It includes most of Europe and so on. But there's a kind of NATO plus countries like um, the Republic of Korea or South Korea, Japan and so on are in a kind of relationship with NATO. They are NATO allies. And then there's an intelligence network started out as the five eyes, um, the old you know, British settler colonial powers, United States, um, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, but now is the 14 eyes, which includes many, many other countries in an intelligence sharing operation. We know a lot about them, thanks to both Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, and other whistleblowers. So the global north is actually a block. They actually operate together, led by the United States. They operate together through the United Nations, they operate together um, in a sense unilaterally by themselves. Um, they go to war against countries, you know, the war against Iraq, for instance, the global north went to war against Iraq almost as a bloc, even though there were some disagreements. And then there's the concept global south. And what we found here was much more of a disparate situation. Um, you know, th this is not organized into a bloc. There are no institutional linkages even the BRICS is a very weak grouping uh, right now it's not exactly like the g7 or it's not exactly like the 14 eyes in fact the global south doesn't have an intelligence sharing operation like the 14 eyes so the global south is a kind of looser grouping of countries not a block as such um now there's a new mood in the global south and i know we'll talk about that later but, you know, that's not the same as having a kind of institutional block. Well, the strength of the global north is interesting when we look at military spending. And the early part of the document is a deep dive into military spending. You know, working with uh, John Bellamy Foster from Monthly Review, um, the GSI team um, and, and Tricontinental, we basically established that U.S. military spending is not $900 billion. It's $1.53 trillion a year because you've got to take everything into consideration, including nuclear weapons. And if that is the case, 75% or three out of every $4 of global military spending per year is spent by the global North countries. China is merely 12%. You know, the Russians far behind, you know, not even at 5% of global military spending. So when you talk about, let's say, inter-imperialist conflict, you lost your mind. I mean, one bloc has 75% of the world's military spending and China has 12%. It's not even a contest. China and Russia are defensive powers. They are not imperialist powers. Russia didn't invade Ukraine in an imperialist gesture, it invaded Ukraine in a defensive maneuver, afraid that Ukraine was going to join NATO and so on. These are defensive powers. These are not offensive imperialist powers. So that argument about inter-imperialist conflict, we've set aside. I don't think it's accurate. The facts don't establish it. And then the argument of multipolarity also doesn't stand because what you have is you have what we are considering the churning of the global order. There are lots of changes happening, but you don't really have different poles set up in the world. You still have the United States led um, powers dominating world affairs. And hence, it's very difficult for other countries to make an impact in Israel's war against Gaza because the United States still dominates the world order. There are US ships sitting in the Eastern Mediterranean blockading um, Gaza, you know, preventing other country vessels to come in that area. When the Yemeni government said we're not going to allow shipping to go through the Red Sea in solidarity with the Palestinians, they had missiles fired on them. I mean, 
you know, th there is no multipolarity established yet. Uh, it is a bit of an illusion. So our text is a direct intervention, fact-based, on in how to understand the world as we live today. We still see the global north in a position of dominance. It is deeply weakened. It has no real project, but it still has immense firepower and it has an immense control over the communication apparatus in the world. Thank you for pointing that out. Not, not to get too much into the weeds, but I, one thing I thought that is important about the term hyper-imperialism is that it seems like it wasn't just a term that was sort of picked out of the air, but there was a connection to previous Marxist thinkers. And from reading the footnotes from the study, this term and ideology behind it seems like it was influenced not only by Lenin, and you were talking about hyper um, inter-imperialist rivalry, but also Walter Rodney, Kwame Nkrumah, and others. Why was it important to consider not just Marx or Lenin, as many on the, on the left, particularly the Euro-American left and the Euro left, but also Marxists from the global South, which some refer to as the global majority. majority. Um, you know, why was it important to, to think about those thinkers as well in, in coming up with this? Well, we spent a lot of time first trying to periodize imperialism. You see, Lenin's text is the most accurate text available on imperialism in his time in 1916 when he put the document together. At the time, there were many different centers of imperialism. There was the United Kingdom, the French, the Germans, the Russian Empire, and so on. And they were contesting with each other and with the United States, which had its own imperialist project in the Americas. They were contesting with each other for the conquest and domination of the global South and for parts of Europe as well, Eastern Europe and so on. So at the time when Lenin was writing, there was indeed an inter-imperialist crisis which led to World War I, which is what he wanted to explain. With the Bolshevik Revolution, the creation of the USSR, the situation changed because then the principal contradiction in the world was between the socialist camp and the capitalist camp. You know, with the third world creating its own uh, dynamic and trying to sometimes modulate the two camps, sometimes working with the socialist camp against the capitalists and so on. But inter-imperialist conflict in the West was dampened um, because the United States, after World War II in particular, the United States basically uh, dominated Italy and Germany, so many military bases, at least West Germany, and the United States dominated Japan um, and brought the, uh, the imperialist uh, powers, the old imperialist powers, to heal. I mean, the Suez Canal events was a good example of how the United States basically brought the British and French into subordination. And so the inter-imperialist conflict begins to weaken. And the primary conflict in that period from at least 19, you know, 30s, but really from 45 until about the 1980s, that period was where the principal conflict was between the capitalist bloc and the socialist bloc. After the collapse of the Soviet Union and then shifts in China uh, in the 1990s, the United States tried to project itself as the principal power in the world. You enter a phase of unipolarity. That's the third phase now. If Lenin's inter-imperialist conflict was the first phase, the second phase where, was where the primary conflict was between the capitalists and socialists. The third phase is when the United States put itself out there as a principal power. It didn't succeed because there were others contesting it, the North Koreans, you know, the Iranians and others. The so-called rogue states didn't comply with the memorandum from Washington saying, look, guys, we are the ones in charge now. So it's always got to be seen the U.S. trying to dominate. Well, after the beginning of the third Great Depression, 2007 onwards, and the U.S. failed wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya, um, as some examples, after that period, new centers of production start to emerge, most of them in Asia, China, India, Indonesia, Russia as well, and so on. And then Brazil, South Africa, Nigeria, Mexico, these economies start to boom on their own the contradictions of globalization. 
And it's in this period that the global North countries led by the United States tried to exert their influence, particularly using extra economic power, sanctions, uh, war, you know, assassinations, threats, intimidation, and so on. And it's that dangerousness and the decadence, because decadence refers to the fact that these countries simply don't have a project for the world. You know, it's not just that Biden is, is incompetent or Trump is crazy or Rishi Sunak is incompetent. In fact, their entire project has exhausted itself. Like, OK, tomorrow, if Biden se steps aside, who's next in the Democratic bench? You know, who's going to take his position? They have no ideas. It's not a question of, look, Biden is too old. I, I think that's a ridiculous discussion. The fact is not about his age. It's that the entire ruling class in the United States has no project for the world. And that lack of a project, you know, in the United States, in Germany, in France, Macron, no project for the world. They want to protect themselves from immigration. They want to build up their militaries and so on. This is the decadence, the lack of a sense of a global commons, the idea that there are people all over the world. So we specifically use the term hyper imperialism uh, to define this sort of dangerousness, you know, like hyperactivity, the dangerousness of this imperialist bloc, which is extremely powerful militarily. You know, they can blow bridges up anywhere in the world. Uh, that's the dangerous side. And then the decadent side, they don't have any ideas, man. That's the basic fact of things. Um, I mean, for God's sake, uh, you know, can I ask you, would you sit through a speech by Biden or Trump or any of these people intellectually barren, nothing there, you know, no concepts for the world, shop worn cliches, you know, nothing interesting. That's the decadence. We mean decadence, not in terms of their boozing and on drugs and whatever. No, no, no I don't. Well, say I don't have a problem with that, but that's not what we're talking about. We use the term decadence to talk about the absence of a sense of the possibilities for the planet. Thank you for pointing that out. And, and even, you know, I was thinking the same thing, um, you know, when, when whether you agree with Putin or not, if you listen to his interviews, it's at least intellectually stimulating uh, at, at a bare minimum. And I, whereas there's no such interview from anyone in the global, in the so-called global north, whether it's Biden or any of the leaders in Europe, that uh, that, that you're going to find any sort of intellectual stimulation, or someone that's even familiar with history and what's going on in the world. I guess um, a follow-up question, and and it'll be somewhat repetitive for you, but I still think it's important to, to get to these concepts. The study does an excellent and effective job of pointing out that there's a quote, erosion of US economic and political hegemony with, with changes in the world order characterized by quote, a southward shift of the economic base with a quote, credible economic and political alternative in the world. Can you discuss these historic changes of which you've done so to a certain extent so far? And how should our friends on the left be perceiving and analyzing uh, this quote, churning of the global order? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, let's go back to Bill Clinton. Um, Bill Clinton presided over the transition from the period when the Soviet Union and the United States or the West, the global North, were in a contest. Um, it was Mr. Clinton who was the president at the time of the Soviet Union's, um, you know, real collapse. I mean, the institutions were really dwindling at the time. Well, the United States, led by Clinton and then across the um, Atlantic Ocean, uh, eventually Tony Blair, just a few years later, um, they made a bet. They made a bet. The bet was rooted in the World Trade Organization. And the bet they made was, look, let's um, shift heavy manufacturing from places like the United States and Germany and so on. Let's move it to the global south, take advantage of lowered wages. You know, let's, um, you know, follow the basic principle of wage arbitrage. If you can get cars manufactured in Mexico, move the factory to Mexico. 
If you can get capacitors manufactured in Mexico, move the capacitor factory to Mexico. You don't need to have it in the global north. Well, if you're going to move factories out of the United States, how do you control, um, you know, the factory itself? And how do you control, um, you know, how do you control the sale of the commodities? Well, there's two ways to do it. One was they broke up the factory. This is very interesting. Rather than have one giant factory, you had an assembly line. You had bits and pieces of the factory in different country. Nobody controlled the whole chain except the multinational corporation, which would source, um, you know, bits and pieces from along the chain, uh, the chain by itself owned by subcontractors. And the way you control the final product was through intellectual property rights. So in fact, the World Trade Organization at the heart of it was the new regime of intellectual property rights. That was the bet. And my God, these multinational corporations made a lot of money because they took advantage of the lowered wages um, in the global south, whether it's in Indonesia um, or it's in, in South America or, you know, in, in Eastern Africa, etc. They made a lot of money on this. But the contradictions were going to come and bite them in a way, because as you move production to other countries, two things happen in your own country. Uh, you don't have manufacturing jobs. So the wages begin to decline even more. Um, and people then have precarious jobs. So in the United States, in Europe and so on, the rise of the precarious worker is directly related to the departure of manufacturing jobs, you know, good quality manufacturing jobs. And so you have people working in, you know, service sector work, delivery and, and, and whatnot in the global north. In the global south, what began to happen was that as companies got greedier and greedier, they signed agreements to transfer technology um, to various firms in the global south, particularly the Chinese. Chinese is very clever because they had highly competent, motivated workforce, well-educated, with very few medical problems, you know, because of the Maoist reforms. Uh, they had better health care, better food, better nutrition. They were not getting sick all the time. That's a problem in India where the workers don't have these, you know, the advantages of the Maoist reforms. So firms were dying to go to China. I mean, the Ruhr Valley of Germany effectively moves to Wuhan in China. And so the bet was the Chinese said, look, show us how you make um, green technology. So the company is so desperate to take advantage of Chinese workers said, this is how we do it. And within a decade, Chinese firms started making the same stuff. I mean, how difficult was it uh, to take a, an iPhone and basically, you know, uh, reverse engineer it and for the Chinese to make a phone? How di not difficult at all. Huawei was basically beginning to make better phones than in, 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 in you know, that were made for Apple in China. I mean, remember that, that all phones are really made in China. And so... The Chinese companies just started to make firms, phones. This transformation of industrial production in the global south, particularly in Asia, this turned over the apple cart because now you suddenly began to see after the third great depression, you know, 2007 wasn't a recession, okay? It was the beginning of a, of a depression. Many countries in the world, Britain or France, have never recovered from that depression they cannot recover in, in one way because they continue to impose austerity on their own people, the governments. United States, there are entire classes that have been wiped out. You know, um, when Trump gave his inaugural address and said there is, an Ameri there is American carnage, that's a phrase he used. Trump may be crazy, but that phrase was correct. The entire classes, rural parts of the United States wiped out. They're not coming back. And, you're, you, and you have growth rates that might rise in the financial sector, but the wages are still downhill for people, different geographic um, you know, areas suffering more than others. But in, in Asia, growth rates have gone up. Now, this doesn't mean that inequality was ameliorated. You know, in India, growth rates are up. Inequality is also up. This is not good for India doesn't matter for the United States because the growth rate is high there. It's stagnant in the United States, near zero, 1%, maybe 2%, and so on. 
two percent of a trillions of dollar size economy is still a lot it's not nothing okay in scale but it's not five percent it's not four percent and it's unbalanced growth because a lot of it is financially driven growth it doesn't translate into a productive society infrastructure redevelopment building hospitals building better quality schools and so on you don't see that repairing bridges talk about the francis keys bridge and so on and it's not just the bridge it's the tugboat drivers i mean where are the tugboat drivers to lead the ships into harbor there used to be so many they are not there anymore okay all of that right so you got the changing of the axis of the economy and this is something that is very difficult to turn around very difficult to turn around because how are you going to compel the billionaires in the united states to allow their super profits to be taxed sufficiently for an actually social democratic government uh, to begin to do salvage investments in a country like the united states rebuild infrastructure increase productivity and so on how are you going to do that how are you going to change food supplies in the united states i mean what's happening is that as a consequence of the subsidies given to uh, the giant food companies more and more people are forced to eat worse processed food um, much worse for your health but also cheapened quality um, you know and which means low wages to immigrant workers in the united states in the food industry that cycle cannot be broken because you don't have a political class that has emerged which is willing to compel the billionaires to have their money taxed to change the the focus of the economy until you have that in the european countries in north america i'm afraid this ship cannot be turned around and so the only quiver you know in the in the in the i mean the only arrow in the quiver in the arsenal um is the arrow of military um you know um intimidation and the use of assorted you know intimidation tactics like sanctions and so on um apart from that you can't compete with the chinese and that is creating an anti china um syndrome in the united states and in in europe which is extremely unhealthy and also not factually based thank you for that answer and and i think it leads perfectly to the next question which you you got into a little bit in the first answer but it is really the the number one question we get from our friends on the left um and that we hear you know from our friends on the left that the us um the, the, the rise of a multipolar world is not a step forward for quote workers or oppressed people because this is like like you were talking about earlier just an inter-imperialist rivalry um but how does this study of hyper-imperialism address or applies lenin's theory of imp uh, imperialism today and to be clear is what we're witnessing with the waning of u.s hegemony and the churning of the global order and the rise of countries like Russia and China and a multipolar world and the conflicts that have erupted as a result of that is that an inter-imperialist rivalry rivalry or is it something else well you know i'm a died in the wool leninist and i am very much a, a student of lenin and i study lenin but i'm not a religious person and lenin is not a god for me you know he's not the prophet that i must follow his writings to the letter lenin wrote in his context you know what he wrote about was correct for his time but we have to build the theory from the facts not from lenin you know uh, lenin will give us a guiding understanding of concepts maybe the method of study and so on but we need to observe the facts right now it is very clear that none of the powers um, you know that are emergent india indonesia china russia and so on brazil none of these powers number one has the will or the project to create a world conquering or a world dominating uh, project they don't they just don't have that uh, they don't have a project to compete with the united states for territory um, or for domination they are not interested actually in fact the chinese directly say this we are not interested 
we don't want to dominate the world we want to develop china and we want to use our surplus to assist others we don't want to dominate the world we don't want to colonize africa we don't have any interest in that so firstly not only do they say that but it's pretty clear um if you look at 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 the at the, the way their projects are unfolding that they are not interested in contesting the united states in a world dominating project that's number one secondly they don't have the means to do it i mean they don't have the military capacity um they don't have the aircraft carriers united states has 902 bases around the world okay uh, these countries don't have any bases one or two bases here and there um the russians have bases basically to keep their ships uh, in a warm water port when all their ports freeze during the winter this is going to change with climate uh, shifts but you know the reason the russians have a port a base in syria is to keep their fleet there during the winter time and that's really the reason why they are there the chinese have a naval base in djibouti but that's to facilitate help the united nations mission against piracy that's not really to dominate it's down the road from the us military base for god's sake i mean they are not going to start a little war in djibouti they are both based in that small country in the horn of africa um they just don't have the means to contest the united states i mean what is it even what are we talking about like china wanting to start a war against the united states it would be suicidal um they are not interested in that the russians are not interested in getting into a war with all of europe i mean i know i read some people online who are enthusiastic you know uh, they want to see this war expanded that would be horrible it would be catastrophic for everybody nobody wants that um you know least of all the russians they are not interested what they want is they want no us missiles within striking distance of moscow short range missiles and medium range missiles there are long range missiles from iowa wherever pointed at the russians but they don't want short and medium range missiles sitting in estonia latvia or in 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 near kiev you know they just don't want that that's why they went to war in ukraine so these countries don't have a project of having a contest with the united states and its allies for world domination and nor do they have the means and therefore i believe there is no inter imperialist conflict there is a conflict imposed on the world a military conflict by the united states and its global north bloc they have imposed conflicts you know take the case of taiwan i mean why is the united states constantly trying to accelerate a war in the south china sea i mean the chinese are not preparing to invade taiwan they believe that over time the taiwanese people will just come to accept the plain fact that they might as well unite with the rest of china you know which is their historical situation they they are willing to wait a thousand years for this they are not interested in sending the red army you know to go and invade taiwan why is the us constantly trying to make this a military issue it's a good example of the us imposing a conflict take the case of cuba i mean cuba is not interested in a conflict with the us frankly the cubans basically want to have the embargo end the blockade end so that they can trade with the world and you know protect the gains of the cuban revolution they are not saying we are coming to miami to take over the united states and so on the us is imposing a conflict there similarly haiti you know when the haitians elected jean bertrand aristide for the first time why did the us intervene and overthrow him in a coup d'etat you know the us intervenes stop intervening that's the basic thing so people who talk about inter imperialist conflict they are unable to understand that lenin is a very important figure in his time you know very important figure in his time he understood his context perfectly we must honor and appreciate that but we can't take his analysis from his context and copy and paste it for our context we have to take the principles of his analysis and look at our facts to build our own theories Thank you for that answer. And I, and I guess a, a follow-up question is, you know, as as we see the rise of a multipolar world, and and as we see leaders um, like we've seen in the Sahel boot the French, and boot, and now they're booting the U.S. For instance, in Niger, 
Um, you know, will we start, will we see stumblings and how should we approach these stumblings or uncertainties or contradictions from the, from as, as a multipolar world rises? You know, politics is interesting. Okay. It never goes in a direct blueprint as you would like it to go. You know, you're not going to have proletarian revolutions. Um, the Russian revolution will not repeat. The Chinese revolution will not repeat. The Cuban revolution will not repeat. The Vietnamese revolution will not repeat. We have very different paths to climb the summit. You know, we are not all following the same track, different countries, different contexts and so on. Um, what we are seeing in the world now is a thirst for a more control over countries, you know, sovereignty. People want sovereignty over their countries. They don't want interference. Um, they want to have more power over their own institutions and so on. This is the thirst. You know, people are fed up with being told what to do, you know, being bullied by the global north, by the IMF, by the World Bank and so on. They want space to build their own politics. Um, and so through this, you might see an acceleration uh, in the direction of the left through this. But you may not. I mean, it may go in all kinds of different places. Uh, it depends on how we intervene in these struggles. You know, the kind of role that that the working class movements play in the, in these struggles. Um, you know, we have to accept the fact that right now in Gaza, it's uh, it's more religious forces that are that are intact and are you know leading the resistance there. It is groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad and so on that are in in the lead there. Well, that's the nature of struggle. You know, I am not a religious person. I don't believe in religious rule and so on. But I can acknowledge that that's a direction that certain struggles take. And one has to go through that, come out on the other side, perhaps with a proletarian perspective. You know, uh, that's part of the long term uh, struggle, the patience, the confidence, you know, uh, the clarity and so on. We've got to be there hammering away. Uh, in solidarity with people's movements, um, you know, making space for people's movements to to move in a certain direction. At the same time, you know, establishing your own principles and 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 being kind of in and out with them. If you understand what I mean, like there are military coups in the Sahel, uh, but these military coups are producing um, governments which are desperately trying to react to the the needs of the people. You know, one of the needs of the people is. Tell the French to go. So they said, French go. Then in Niger, they say, tell the Americans to go. Well, the Americans should go. But then what's next? You know, what are the next set of ideas that um, they are going to put forward? I'm very interested to follow what is going on there. And also, you know, interested to see what the trade unions are doing in these countries, um, what other political organizations are doing. Very interested to see, um, you know, how they are able to push and move and, and so on. Uh, in, in countries like Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, um, and, and, and other places in the world. Thank you for that answer. I guess you, my last question is, you know, what role should popular movements play in this changing global correlation of forces or the, the churning of the global order? Yeah, I mean, it, the, you know, obviously, again, it's a practical question and it, it depends on the context because popular movements in different parts of the world uh, we'll have different strengths and different ability to move an agenda. Um, if we talk about in the global north, I think one of the key aspects is um, the fight against military expenditure. I mean, it, the fact that in the United States, the U.S. government spends $1.53 trillion a year on the military is an abomination. You know, you have crumbling infrastructure. You have children unable to meet a basic standards of, of education set by decent and hardworking teachers. Uh, you have a medical system in shambles. You know, the condition of cities is in deep problem, not enough infrastructural workers, you know, people to maintain infrastructure and so on. Um, and yet 1.53 trillion in the military. I think an anti-war movement, a peace movement, it's very important for Western countries, you know, call an end to the war in Ukraine, you know, call for peace over there, a call for a drawdown of military spending. You know, the United States government telling European countries 
you got to lift your military spending to 2% of gdp many of them are 1.1 1.2% and so on why should they let them keep the military spending down spend towards helping people solve and address the dilemmas of humanity don't spend to build fortresses you know i think in the global north that has to be the principal issue is all the data we looked at the most objectionable part of the data is the amount the obscene amount spent on the military and the culture of the military i mean you know the super bowl for instance the military jets flying all over a uh, military on the field you know what is this military religion you know the civic religion of the united states has been transformed into a religion of the military uh, and i think that's something that trade unions should be in the lead talking about um, the conversion you know do you really need to build more submarines what about high speed rail you know what about trains you know if if somebody is in new york city um they there needs to be a very fast train that connects new york city to all the other cities along the east coast not the lumbering accela you know so expensive so slow uh, often late and so on you need high speed rail connecting you to chicago you need to have less people flying in planes more people taking high speed rail but you can never have that if you are spending 1.53 trillion dollars on the military so i would say people in the global north the focus must be um you know draw down the culture of violence in society the culture of militarism uh, do you really need five guns in your home i mean you are one person five guns how many hands do you have thank you for that answer i could ask you questions for days um but i want to be respectful of your time is is there anything else that you want to discuss or you think we should know um before we close well i want to say that you know the things that you're doing the kind of work that you do at activist news network other channels such as yours they're so important because we live in a period where media suffocation is extreme you know i mean i don't even know how long you will last on the platforms you know on youtube and so on um you know this work is actually so important because so many people are thirsting for different kind of ideas challenging ideas they have the right to challenge them uh, but you know there is no space uh, in the suffocating media you just don't have a discussion anywhere about something like military spending it would be considered completely out of the question you know broadcast television channels in the united states many of them are owned by military companies um including you know general electric and so on uh, these are military contractors they would never allow a discussion uh, on of that we've been having so i mean i just want to first congratulate you for taking the time persisting in 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 doing this building an audience and so on and i also want to say that people who do watch your channel listen to you should go out there and help you build an audience because otherwise it's not enough for me and you to talk and a small number of people to listen it's not enough to listen it's important for people to become in a way activists for your channel you know to bring an audience to you so i i think you know i think well played sir well thank played and, and thank you for the study thank you for all all you do i i, I try to read everything you write and watch all of your interviews and i will you know again note for the audience to to watch the 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 weekly um show that you do with Prashant um and Zoe Alexander give the people what they want it is really one of the best if not the best weekly news summary uh, internationalist or left leaning news summaries um on people's dispatch so I, right back at you VJ and and your comrades there please please check that out thank you VJ for coming back on the show it's always an honor and hope to have you back again soon Anytime. Take care of yourself. Thank you. That was great. Hey, 